Right, we're good. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm A.D. Mornmesh. I'm from Manchester. We're just about to begin. We're from Manchester, Palestine Action, and um, uh, we've been invited very kindly by everybody up here at Scottish PSC. Uh, we're really honoured to be here. We want to make lots of links with everybody here. We see and are inspired by so many actions up here, many of which Dead Sea shops that you did so brilliantly to shut down. Many are related to what we do in Manchester as well. Uh, we've just come back from uh, Birmingham, as it happens, working with Birmingham Palestine Action, amongst many others, as well as the PSC groups down there, uh, where we did shut down an Israeli weapons factory again. So that was wonderful. <laughs> and... Um, that's about the third or fourth time for some of us, which is great. Um, and it was that we also raised over nearly £20,000 for Middle East Children's Alliance, which is Dr. Mona al -Fara. Um I worked with her and their work with uh, women and, and children's groups. It's certainly about empowerment, development, and, uh, and it's also linked to p the politics of action, uh, which is what everybody here should be linked to, especially after today. Um, I was in Gaza for two years, and uh, the one thing I think that as much as we give incredible credit to the wonderful speakers here like Ilan, Pape, and Ben White, and, and all the others who, if anybody had asked Palestinians 67 years ago, 60 years ago, 55, 50, 40, 30 years ago, you'd have got the exact narrative that they've produced. The difference is, is because they've been so demonized and so isolated um, from the narrative uh, with such incredible racism, sadly, to penetrate the West uh, people had to wait for an Israeli or, or an English academic to put the word out. I was in Gaza, you can knock on any door, you'll ask them where they're from and they'll tell you a village that doesn't exist anymore in all likelihood, like Barbara, like Megzdel, like, like uh, Bet Jerja. Um, all these places that no longer, uh, that have been turned to rubble, that's the history, that's the living history. And it's for that that I'm so pleased today that we have uh, Mahmoud Zawahra here today. He's um, He's, I've just been, I've heard all about his work and also the work of the groups he's, he's, he's involved with, which is the Palestinian Popular Resistance Coordinating Committees uh, in Al Masra in the Bethlehem area. Uh, and it's linked to all the other resistance movements on the ground, facing the violence of the Israeli army, regularly standing up for people's villages, saying we'd rather die standing than die in our beds. And it's the same narrative I heard from Gaza. It's that courage, it's that courage to maintain dignity in all this, which I think is why we should always be turning to the Palestinian voices, not only for the narrative, but also for the inspiration that they give to every single one of us. He's also instrumental in establishing the Al-Masra uh, Popular Resistance Committee, and he's currently doing a PhD in Peace and Conflict Studies at Coventry University. So everybody, please, uh, unfortunately we can't have questions uh, afterwards, but we can have questions in the next session when he'll be up here. Um, uh, so we'll, we'll wait for the next session for questions to him. I'm sure there'll be many. I'd like to think that for the Palestinian contingent, there'll be the most questions. And uh, also, if you have any announcements, could you please speak to Sophia and bring the announcements to her at the back there, and uh, we'll do them all later at the end of the, uh, the next session. Okay, so if you could speak to Sophia if you have any announcements for the day, that'd be wonderful. But without further ado, can we please give a big round of applause to Mohamed Zawahra, please. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for inviting me and giving me the chance in order to deliver a message from the Palestinians to you. And today, in order to understand the context of the settler colonialism, we don't want to talk about the negative uh, image that Israel wants to uh, implement on the Palestinians, but let's look at the positive side, how the Palestinians, after 68 years, managed to stay in Palestine and almost five million, five million Zionist, five million Palestinians living between the river and the sea, which means that the Zionist movement didn't succeed in a way or another to implement the Zionist project that they dreamed 100 years ago or more. 
And this is coming because of a secret that is inside the Palestinians, which is resilience. Even the Israeli policy is very systematic one. And there where we can say the settler colonial process that is implemented against the Palestinians. I remember myself as a child, when I was a child, 10, 11 years old, I was able to go to Jerusalem with my father to sell grapes in Jerusalem without any checkpoints, without any even noticing that there is occupation on the ground as a child. But day after day, when we start to see the Israeli policies on the ground, I found it easier for me to come to Edinburgh rather than reaching Jerusalem after 30 years, which means that there is a systematic behavior from the Israeli occupation government in order to implement these policies on the ground. That's where we can find the settler colonial things on the ground. It's easier for people to come thousands of miles instead of crossing five miles to be in Jerusalem. This is one behavior in order to detach people from their land, in order to evict this from the minds of the people, thinking that the, the country is a, 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 just some soil. They don't know that the soil is mixed with the blood, with the genetics of the person as a Palestinian. That's why the Palestinian managed to stay. And if, you, if we followed all the policies that Israel implemented on the ground, from building settlements, building segregation walls and apartheid walls, annexing land, and also putting all of this in a, le a legitimized system and find the legislation for this, this is a settler colonial behavior. And where we can find that? We found that in the old city of Jerusalem. When they come to the people, if you want to add a small part to your house, maybe you have to pay hundred thousands of pounds in order to be able to do it. If you want to put the service of electricity or water, you have to put thousands and thousands of pounds in order to be able to do it. This is a systematic behavior from the government of the occupation against the Palestinians in order to control them, in order to make them lose hope, in order to leave the country. That's what's going on in the old city of Jerusalem. And if you notice how many Palestinians left the old city of Jerusalem because of this settler colonial behavior in the old city of Jerusalem, building the wall around Jerusalem annexed 300,000 Palestinians from the, old, from the district of Jerusalem, which means that they want to get rid from the people. And that is not the end of the story because according to the Zionist, between the river and the sea, there is nothing called Palestinians. It's Judea and Samarith, as they call it. So they do not want to come with the Palestinians to a solution. They want to keep with this systematic behavior till they kill the existence of the Palestinians in Palestine. This is how the Israelis are following this policy not only in 1967. So if we want to believe in the two-state solution and we want to look at the Palestinians who are living in Israel, who are now 20% of the Israeli society, and we want to look at them. Look at, uh, to the south of, of uh, Palis historical Palestine in the Nakav. How many times they evicted Bedouin villages? More than 100 times they evicted these people. So why you are evicting these people, even they are carrying the Israeli citizenship while you are building the infrastructure for the illegal colonies just next door to these communities? It's just to reflect the settler colonial mind that the government is carrying against another group. It's because they are 
another ethnicity, another people, they are a second class people that they do not want to see them. So the idea at the end is how to send them out of the country and to replace them with other settlers coming from all over the world. This is exactly what's happening. And what, is happ what happened in, uh, before 1948 is now going to be repeated in 1967. We started with settlers in 1967 with thousands, and now they are more than half a million settlers. And how Israel, as citizens, as government, as civil administration, as police, as army, completing each other, are one system. I give you some stories from how the settlers are annexing and confiscating land and how the Palestinians are resisting them. Around Bethlehem, where I am living in a village called Al Masara, to the south of Bethlehem, there is the Gosh Atzioni block settlements, which is one of the biggest blocks. More than 100,000 settlers are living there. So the civil administration give access to the source of information to the settler organizations, such, such as Women in Green. This organization, Women in Green, is taking land from Palestinians. So the civil administration give access to the information to this, uh, to this organization. So they told them, like this is a state land, this is since, since the Ottoman Empire, this farmer registered like five donums, and he owns 20 donums, so put your tent here, put your mobile house here, try to attack this land. And one of the farmers, they put a mobile house in his, in his land. And everyone admit and recognize that this land is connected to Da'du'a. Da'du'a is a farmer from Al Khadr village. So this man came and found that there is a mobile house in his, in his land. So he get angry. And the Israeli law, in this case, the Palestinian who owns this land since hundreds of, of years have to prove that this land is for him. Not this a new settler who just arrived with his mobile house to prove that the, this is his land. So you see the how they play the role. They ask the settler to come and to put his mobile house. They ask the Palestinian, okay, come, claim against this settler, open a case, and we will, we will, we will follow it. Why you just not ask the settler to prove that this is his land? And this Da'adur get angry. And this, there is a woman on the head of this organization came with two men to attack him by axe. And two men caught him, and a third one to attack him by axe. And you know, in such situation, you want to escape. So he did it. And one of the settlers injured in his knee. And Da'adur was in jail for three months because he was defending himself to escape from killing him by axe. And the settler, was not excused by doing anything. Even he was carrying the ax to kill the Palestinian. This is the behavior. This is how the Israeli behavior, in a way, to kill the motivation inside the Palestinians in order to leave the country. This is not since 1948. You, you can go before and you can see the Haganah and the groups, how they were killing the Palestinians in their villages, and they kill women, children. That is not something in you. They know exactly how to behave in order to kill the motivation inside the Palestinians in order to let them leave. But on the contrary, the daily life of the Palestinians is full of resistance. And when the people taste the resistance, they feel proud of themselves. And they feel that they are able to stand in front of the Israeli army, in front of the settlers, and they are able to defend their land. And we noticed and witnessed that 
in different villages through the unarmed resistance in these villages. When Israel start to build the wall and to control the resources of these villages from water springs, from access to land and so on. When we notice that the people are able to practice resistance, they are more powerful. They are no more demotivated. They are no more feeling that they have this apathy and they want to leave the country. No, on the contrary. They get motivated and they encourage others and they form an example in front of the Palestinians and especially in front of the Palestinian leadership to tell them resistance is the solution. Resistance is the solution. The solution is not in London or in Washington. The solution is in the hands of a Palestinian child to stand in front of the Israeli army and to put his finger in the eyes of, his, of the Israeli army. From there, we start the solution. And if there is no crisis in Palestine, if there is no demonstrations, actions, resistance, what will motivate you? You will cry every day about what is happening in Palestine. An olive tree was uprooted, a house was demolished. Okay, let's collect some money for them, and that's it. And this is exactly what Israel wants. Israel don't want the crisis to be in Palestine, not to be in Edinburgh. Because if there is no crisis in Palestine, there will be no crisis in Edinburgh. So this form of unarmed resistance bring the power of the people, convert the people from victims to people who are able to act, from people who are escaping in front of the soldiers to people who are able to confront the soldiers. Why? Because we give the people the chance to stand in front of the army, to stand in front of the settlers, to cultivate their land and to be attached to their land not to wait for some aids from abroad in order to be given to them. And unfortunately, people understand solidarity with Palestine in terms of charity. This is destructive. Solidarity with Palestine is how to, to, to motivate Palestinians. And this is, we will come later to talk about it. And we will come to talk how Israel is really angry about this resilience of Palestinians and what traps they put in order to kill this resilience among Palestinians. So with this daily land, you don't know that how the settlers are using the carrot and the stick with the Palestinian farmers. I know farmers who managed to who the settlers, to kick them out, to kick them out a way that they, they cultivated their land. Israel wants to detach people from their land because they know land means water, means resources, and all of this. And this contradicts with the settler colonialism project that those people must be focused, concentrated in places where they will look for the first ports leaving the Mediterranean in order to come as a political refugees to Europe. This is what they want because they don't want them to have access to their to their resources. I'll give you another example of a community in South Hebron Hills. Those people are living in caves. And those people are distributed, if you look at the map, from here up to Hebron. And the Israelis want to evict them, to push them. And you know, one of the Israeli behaviors is how to concentrate people in places in small places, small areas like Gaza. I don't know from where they learned this, how to put people in concentration. I don't know from where they learned this. This is something I'm, I'm wondering about it. Like why they like to put people, did it examined before? Is any regime examined this before to put people in concentration places, camps? Why the Israelis want to repeat this? So they want to push the people from the south in order to put them in these concentration places so the people are living in caves, but the people are, are strong. One day, when they came to demolish the mosque that they demolished three times, and they demolished the houses, even the small 
places where they put the electricity generators. And if you come just out from one of the caves and look out, you will see the settlements with all the infrastructure. Those settlers are coming from all over the world. Just yesterday, and those people who are living in the caves since before the creation of what's so-called Israel, and they are still there. And they do not have the chance to have electricity and water and to have services and to have permission to build houses. But the resilience pushed them to live in caves and not to leave the land. And when I talk to one of the women in this community, when she was arrested and she was disappeared for eight days and her father was looking for her, and when she was released, and I think Sousan, she was not in England, she told me, we are not poor. And we are able to build our houses. But we want to protect our houses. And we want internationals and the people all over the world to stand us beside us to protect our houses. Not to build and then Israel will come and destroy and build and destroy. We want to stay in our, our land. All the words that you hear from Palestinians, they destroy, we build. They uproot, we plant. This is how the Palestinians managed. Those people from Al-Araqib village in the Nakab, more than 100 times they evicted them, but they come back, they come back, they come back. Why? They are able to go and live in big towns with electricity and air conditions and all the facilities. But they preferred the hard life because this is their land. And for the Israelis, they don't know about this meaning. They are ready to uproot Zionists from Edinburgh to let them go and live in Israel in settlements just because it's a matter of colonial settlement. It's a matter of occupation. They don't know what does it mean, the place where you born, where you grown up. They don't know this meaning. They just want to collect people. After they create the army, they, want, they created the people, they brought people from all over the world, and they created, uh, created a state. So, with this daily behavior of the people, they managed. Even this Israeli behavior, take the old city of Hebron. Some roads are prohibited for Palestinians to use, like Shuhada Street. It's not allowed for Palestinians to use. This is apartheid or not. And when you talk to them, and there is a dialogue, and th this is something important for you to understand. In, in order for Israel to implement this project, they have to prepare their people. And they prepared the, the generations of Israel in order to be to support this project. Otherwise, they know that this society will not support what they are doing. So they are working on their society. So when they think in building the wall, it's not against me because they are also jailed because they think that building the walls and the ground will protect the mind of their society not to be polluted by liberated ideas that's coming from the East or the West. They want to, them as machines, if they tell them the sun uh, rays from the west, they will say yes. This is how they want to control their society. So when the Palestinians ask them why it's not allowed for us to, to walk, and I did it I, in Hebron, when I want to come through these roads that they block, uh, it's not allowed for you. Why it's not allowed for me? Because you are they, they don't know why. Uh, but are you Jewish? You know, they will ask you, are you Jewish? So what's the connection between you and the Jewish? I cannot understand. So they don't have any legal frame, but they are machines, they want to repeat the things. And in these junctions, they start to put soldiers. And once I was out of jail, and I don't care if they want to send me again, I don't care. So I was approaching them, and he told me, no, no, it's not allowed for you to stand here. I told him, why? And he was looking to the face of the other soldier, why it's not allowed for him to, to... 
just tell me illegal things that I cannot stand here. But he wants to tell me because you are not Israeli. But we are not in Israel. We are in Palestine. But all of these uh, circumstances, <laughs> it's unlogic. But they are not strong. We are weak as internationals and as Palestinians. They are, n they are lying. And they are lying and lying until the others believe them and they believe themselves. And we remember that from history. So when they lie and they know that they lie and they want people to believe, this is another thing. So if we do not defend whom we are waiting for, David Cameron to come and to defend Palestinians at the end of 100 years of Balfour Declaration, he will not come. We, maybe there will be a new size speaker for the Middle East after 100 years or another Belfort Declaration after 100 because it's not going to work anymore. So with resistance, this is an obstacle in front of the settler colonialism. So in Hebron, in the last wave, they divide the roads, paths. This is for is Israelis and this is for Palestinians and when the Palestinians come to walk through they tell them no you are not Jewish you are not allowed for you so please do not use the word Jewish Arab Jewish conflict is helping the Zionist movement when we say Arab Jewish conflict means that we dropped the Palestinian identity and we make it Jewish Arab conflict and when you say Jewish you connect it with something that you cannot change the minds of the people. So we have our Jewish friends who are anti-Zionist. Our fight is against a political movement called the Zionist movement, not with a religion, <laughs> not with a religion. <laughs> and keep on and don't let them put you in the trap of Zionism and anti-Semitism issue. Because if we repeat this word, means that we are going into the tunnel that they are they drawn for us in order to be in. And we do not want to defend ourselves. We want to act, always to act. So, with all of this, Israel, I mean, till the first Intifada, they didn't manage to destroy the internal resilience of the Palestinians. So the only thing that they can do it through is from within. Is from within the Palestinians they will be able, they think, that they will destroy the resilience of the Palestinians. And this is where the Israelis focus too much on this. So with Oslo and thanks to Oslo, we are divided. We are divided, and from there we start to have the problems. In, in the first Intifada, we gave an example to all the world, all over the world, that the Palestinians with unarmed resistance, they are able to achieve something. And they come up with Oslo. That Oslo brought two programs in a way that it opened the doors of the international aid to come inside Palestine and to create what so-called NGOs and all these things in the Palestinian society. So this destroy in a way or another the values and the social cohesion among people. And this it create division among Palestinians. And this also create personal interest among the leadership. So if they're with all of this, people start to say what we can do, how to, how to solve this problem. So there was a division that led to Gaza and to West Bank, and there was all of these things. And what we want to focus on is how to increase the resilience of the people, how we want to stand in front of this, not to hear Netanyahu talking, I am willing to help the Palestinian. I am interested in making the life of the Palestinians more easy and more, uh, more smooth than the Palestinian leadership. 
This is what he came out with the last video on, pre, uh, on Channel 4, if you saw. In a way, in this case, they know they start to find ways to enter to the Palestinians from within. And this, in a way or another, affects. So, they, with Oslo, there is no daily contact with the big towns. It's only the areas which fit exactly with the settler colonial, colonialism project. That they are not interested in these big towns. They are interested in the villages, in the land, in the water, in all of these things. So they created these problems among the Palestinians. And in a way there was the Palestinian activists are living under double pressure. One from the Israelis and one from this new social context that created in Palestine. So whether we are going to work with this party or with, or with that party, we have to create cohesion among the people of the villages in order to go on. And yesterday, there was a call for the people to, do, to participate in the demonstrations from the political parties in Nabi Saleh, for example. And they didn't show up. But the people of the village went out. And that is the impact of the resistance. That is the impact of how the resistance motivates people to continue. And we become addicted to this. And we cannot imagine our, our life without resistance now. So, but with this, with all the problems that the political parties are facing, we cannot allow Israel and America to put their finger in the Palestinian society and to create an uh, alternative which can deal with the demands of Israel. And this is what they want. That's why we need to be careful about when we are talking about alternatives, new leadership, uh, whatever. We have to pay attention because whatever the political parties, they are destroyed, penetrated, uh, they have personal interests, some of their leadership, but they are still able to have people on the ground. But the new leadership, if you remember, now what Israeli interest is how to bring back the rule of the civil administration on, on the areas. And they want to create Palestinian uh, local leaders in order to rule the situation. And this is very dangerous. So we need to be aware of how we present the things in a way that we do not serve the settler colonial uh, project. And by going within the Palestinian, by uh, deepening the division among Palestinian, Israel want to see how this will impact on the resilience of the people. And in a way, when we start to see Palestinians leaving the country, we were coming to the camps, talking to the people, to the refugees, and even they are living a very miserable situation, they tell you the first sentence, we will come back, we will return. These are the, key, the keys of our houses. These are the papers of our land. We will go back. It's our right to return to our homes and, and villages. But what Israel is doing in, in this is that they want to create apathy in the, within the mentality of the people that they don't want them to, to come against them. And they start doing this since long time. And in these days, in some places, I would say, look, to, uh, look for example, in Gaza, why the people start to leave in boats because of internal project, uh, problems. And this helps. And this helps Israel in order to achieve their goals. So what we have to work in is our unity. And our unity cannot come without resistance. If there is no resistance, we will always chatting with each other, talking to each other. But if there is the resistance, all of us will look at the same place, at the same goal, which is to fight against occupation. And that's what happened in these villages. I am coming from a village. We start the demonstrations in 2006, after Bil'in one year. And we heard about other experience before. When I witnessed the farmers eating the soil of 
the land in front of the bulldozer, I said, this, this people will never be defeated. Ha what push you to eat the soil of your land? It's the attachment. It, it's the resilience. It's the love that your blood is mixed with this land. And you will never leave it. You will never let them take it. And another image, and it comes all over the world, when you saw the woman is hugging the olive tree that is uprooted by the Israelis. And how come they don't know that this olive tree is bringing oxygen even to their children? How come they accept to uproot olive trees and they didn't feel shame that these olive trees are older than the age of their estate? And these olive trees are planted ages since hundreds of years, and Israel is only 68 years old. And these images, when you see it, you feel that the people will last, and never ever the occupation will be able to defeat people. So these images, and people start to come out because it, you touch their land, you touch their trees, so they come out in demonstrations. And I found that the people don't want to use weapons. It's not a matter of weapon. It's a matter of faith. How much faith you carry for it. Whatever Israel is having, a nuclear weapon, chemical weapons, phosphoric weapons, against civilians, what they can do? What they can do? I saw them using paper, the same as the police here in England, paper, uh, tear gas, sticks, after the nuclear weapon, they come to use sticks against people. So you see how with the people behavior, with the people, like just to come out, it's a matter of achieving something. Internally, it, in, in the Israeli side, and also internationally. And this, when you see the women coming out, and I saw like many in many villages, the women come kicking the soldiers, uh, bringing them out of their, from their villages. And the soldiers don't know. This is not what they told us. They told us something different. Maybe they were looking if we have tails, if we are humans or not. We are Islamic tourism with all this uh, phobia that they are bringing. But they found people in front of them. And the most thing that they found, internationals. And also Israelis with us. So they start to think, with, we are fighting whom? We are fighting all the world? So this is what we have to bring, the impact, this psychological dimension of the war. We have to put it in their playground, not in our minds. What will happen to us? Why every Labour Party member, if he talked about a Zionist movement, we suspend him from the party. We suspend him from, why? Because of the fear. So the first thing, that we have to work on is how to come out of our fear. How to get rid from the fear that they put in our minds. I came back to Palestine last this July. And to be honest with you, I felt the fear. And I was passing through these junctions where I was just, thank God, if I am able to pass this junction. But I was remember when we were able to block these junctions, what happened? Why the Israelis managed to push us to this corner where we have to feel the fear? You know? So they, in, in, in these 20 days when I went to Palestine, I saw that the settlers want to shoot, want to kill. The soldiers are standing to shoot and to kill. So they want the fear to be rooted in the people in order not to use this this way. So go and look for alternative because, for example, in 1991, when they start to put these obstacles in front of going to Jerusalem, people start to look for alternatives. And now in West Bank, they are doing this in order to isolate the people from the uh, surroundings of the settlements. So at the end, they can give us, let's say, this 11% of the historical Palestine where you can see some concentration camps in the north and in the south. So, with also driving on the roads, nowadays with, with the settlers, 
give you the impression that they will do something for you, they will kill you, they will, and they want us to feel the fear. But how to come out from the fear is by resistance. And I examined this on the people on, in different villages, and I found people from victims to people who are able to act. One day, and maybe I told this story before, with my colleague, we came to a Palestinian farmer in his land, sitting, dying in front of a bulldozer that is destroying his land. So with my friend, we jumped on the bulldozer driver and we bring him down and we told him, bring back everything. No, I can't. The security came, the Israeli security. I mean, the security of the settlement, not the occupation forces. And he want like to scare us. We told him, go away. We don't talk to you. Bring us the police, bring us the army. So the, the police came and the, when the police came and they asked for the papers while they are destroying, we discovered that the, the uh, security of the settlement is an Italian mafia guy who came to, to Israel and he is just want to annex more and more land in order to take money for this. And we discover that it's his own decision. And we managed to stop the bulldozer. And when we look at the owner of the land, the farmer, the Palestinian farmer, he stand up. He, stand, he managed to stand up when he saw that the bulldozer is bringing back the soil to the ground. So, with resistance, we are able to bring something. We are able to change the situation in Palestine. But, Palestinians by themselves are not enough. They are enough to create the crisis, to make the fight, and so on. But we have a, a, role, a role for you. And you are not a third party. You are a solidarity people. Which means that we do not want to play the role of the United Nations. It's enough to have one United Nation. No? We want to, to be to the side of the people who you feel that they are living under injustice. So, since Palestine is under occupation, it's logic as a third party between brackets or solidarity people to stand beside the Palestinians and to stand in order to end this occupation. And I am not sin saying this in order to generalize but we know like some where we are, we are in the middle, we cannot take a side in this history. No, we can't take a side. If we do not take a side, this means that we are uh, fostering the situation that it is now on the ground and the Palestinians are losing. The, they are losing their land and the facts on the ground. So this we have to pay attention to. And what we can do, and I know that you know more than me what you can do, especially here when uh, we are talking about BDS and we are talking about like, ah, BDS is, is something negative. No, we want to punish the Israelis. If Israel is a democratic country, we are punishing the Israeli people. If Israel is a dictator, is a, an authoritarian dictatorship country, we are punishing the government. But if the government is elected immediately by the people, this means that this reflects the opinion of the people. This means that the people are supporting this government. This means every morning this mother is sending her son as a soldier to kill and to punish them, not to throw them in the sea, just not to let them benefit from, from being occupying another country by buying their products, by culturally boycotting them, by academically bo boycotting them, and this is our right. If Israel is disciplined to the law, why to punish them? If Israel ends this occupation, why, why, why to boycott them? So this is something we have to increase, and you know that Israel is putting a plan to end the BDS by 2025. And you know that they deny, they banned Mustafa Barghouti to enter Canada two days ago. So they are working. <coughs> and they are investing a lot of money in order to end this movement and in order to, uh, to stop this movement. 
and be sure that all these anti-Semitic issues and Zionist issues is because of the success of, run of BDS movement. So let's keep on it. Let's move with it and to encourage it and to go from door to door with it. And now in Palestine, you know that they discover that there are some Israeli products coming with, with health problems, with, uh, I don't know, uh, chemicals or stuff like that. So now not only the Palestinians are calling for, boycott, activists are calling for boycott, but also the, the doctors, the hospitals, and everyone is calling to boycott the Israeli products. So let's do it. Another issue is how constructively to support Palestinians. In a way, we are looking for resistance, resilience. The resilience where we are able to make the people stay in their land by building them shoulder by shoulder, not to give the Palestinian charities in a way that kills the voluntary soul with the Palestinians. With all of these, we will be able, we will be able to stop the settler colonial project that Israel is implementing in Palestine. I mean, 68 years with all the resources that Israel have from the West and from the East, from all what they implement on the ground from policies and systematic behavior in Palestine. Still, the Palestinians are there. And we started when Israel occupied or created in 1948 by kicking out 750,000 Palestinians and they left 200 Palestinians in their house, in their homes. Now they are 2 million, which means that they want, they want to evict these people, but they are unable to do it. Even in 1948, more than 90% of the land is owned by Palestinians. And nowadays, less than 5% is owned by the Palestinians who are living in Israel. Which means that this systematic behavior is sieging and choking the Palestinians who are living in Israel in 1948 and in 1967. Which means that they are not stopping. But on the other side, on the other hand, the Palestinians continue to stay, continue to resist, continue to even have more and more children to stay in that land. And with the richness of the culture that Israel will never be able to stall from us, even if they said the embroidery is Israeli, the falafel is Israeli, and maybe in a few years the kofiya will be Israeli. <laughs> this, with this richness of culture, they will never be able to evict us. With this richness of history and all what we have in Palestine, they will never be able to evict us. And with all the values that we are carrying, believe me, that anyone who sold his land in Palestine, this will follow him forever. And he is unable to stay in Palestine. Anyone spied for Israel and working as a spy for Israel will never be able to stay in Palestine and will never be able to be proud of himself. And I know, I know some people who their parents are spies and they are not carrying the responsibility of their parents. They left Palestine because they are unable to keep their faith in front of the Palestinians. People with these values will never leave the country for the occupier. Also the religious values and that Palestinians are carrying, Muslim and the Christians, when we are talking about this, they never think that this country is a meaning without the holy places that it is in, from churches and mosques in Jerusalem, Hebron, in Bethlehem, everywhere. So with all of this, how come Israel will be able to evict the people? How come a country of 68 years will be able to evict Jewish, Muslim, Christians from their origin? How come? And I want you to be sure that together we will be able to end this. 
we will be able to, to stand in front of this settler colonial project. From a daily practice, resistance is the solution, international solidarity to find the pressure on the Israelis, and to stand beside also the Israeli activists that we do not want to ignore their role in this day. And to remember that in a few months, last few months, they arrested many of them and they spied on them. They were spying them everywhere, planting spies among them in order to know what they are doing. And they arrested some of them because they were sending spies, because they know that they are effective, because they do not want to create a trust between Palestinians and Israeli activists. They want to create division among them. And this is what happened to a group of Ta'ayush when they arrested Izra and Guy and others because they were leaking information to the Palestinians that there was a Palestinian spy who wanted to leak the land to the settlers and they arrested them. So with those people, with you, with the Palestinians, it will be a circle that will siege the Israeli occupation in order to force them to end this occupation. And then David Cameron will intervene. Please, let's end this occupation. And also Mr. Obama will intervene. But the power starts from us as people in the ground. I don't know if I have time anymore. Thank you very much. Right, we are, <clears throat> we are going to be uh, breaking up for lunch, um, and uh, we just want to say that uh, it's just an absolute privilege to be at Tav Mahmoud here today. Uh, we're lucky enough that he's going to be in the, session, the next session after lunch, um, so I'm sure you've got lots to ask him. You can give him a few questions in between for lunch, but give him a chance for his sandwich as well, if that's possible. He's just made it over here, um, but obviously you get to ask him after that. Um, it's, just, uh, it's just really, really something that we should all be thinking about. It's echoing the Palestinian voice. And I think Mahmoud has proven once again why we should be doing that at all costs, because it is only the Palestinian voice that can really penetrate and explain what's happened for the last 68 years to the Palestinian people. And it's only the Palestinian voice that is really going to inspire us to take more action with more bravery here, given what they are facing every time they go out and defend their village. So I would like everybody to give another big round of applause to Mahmoud Zawahra, please. I wanted to remind everybody before you, before you go as well, I'll pass you on, I think, to Sophia as well very quickly, um, is that uh, we are obviously, obviously people are volunteering to make this incredible day of events, but also the whole week of action. And, uh, and obviously, if you do get a chance just to give a little few donations as well as the big donation at the end, that would be much appreciated to keep all this going and, uh, and of course, to help everybody bring more incredible people to to Scotland and to, and to Britain generally to, to be able to spread and tell us exactly what's going on in Palestine. And uh, yeah, and briefly, I'll just give you to Sophia a minute. Yeah. This one, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Sophia, go up. It might be better for you to go up. Sorry, Sophia. Very, very, very briefly. Um, we're going to break up for lunch and back here at 1.45 where there's going to be a, a Q&A session. 2.45, sorry. Uh, <laughs> um, 2.45, but I just want to say quickly, at the end of the day, um, for anyone who wants to uh, meet together for dinner, um, there's a place nearby, uh, the, uh, an Indian place, I think. If you're interested, if you have a word with Angus at the end there, and he can book a space if, if you're interested in uh, dining together. That was all. So see you back here in about an hour. Oh, uh, if anyone has an announcement, if they can speak to me in the, in the break and at the start of the next session, we'll make a few announcements. Thank you.
So viewers, um, you should hear me okay now, just about. I'll just get rid of Sophia's name. So hopefully that stream went um, slightly smoother than the first session. Um, Swap the audio around a bit, so uh, yeah, we're not dealing with the house PA anymore. <laughs> Our own lights. Um, so as you heard Sophia say there, we shall be going for a break for about an hour. So I shall stop the stream again. Um, yes, so we shall see you back in about an hour. So yeah, it's now 20 to, to 2, so somewhere in the region of 23. Goodbye.